To understand Islam and the Muslim world more, buy my book The Curse of God Why I Left Islam. Available in all your favorite online bookstores. a decent sized audience here. Uh, for this reason, uh, we will only be accepting questions and not statements for the attendees. Please be sure to keep your uh, questions as direct and brief as possible. We'll also only be accepting one question at a time. If you have multiple questions, we will endeavor to answer all of them, uh, but uh, after giving our other attendees the opportunity to have their questions answered as well. So please raise your hands if you have any questions for our speakers in relation to their experiences or opinions. And the uh, two panels. <laughs> Evan? Um, what do you reckon can be done to help uh, ex Muslim refugees seek asylum in certain places? Oh, well. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so passionate about this topic actually because I get so many messages. I'm so passionate about this topic because I get so many messages, particularly from Somali refugees, um, that like are begging because, you know, like, you know, obviously Somalia, you know, it's a Sharia country so um, and I, do, I just don't know what to say to them because I know that it's just not going to happen never going to happen and I'm there's also that risk of them you know trying to go through to Europe and stuff so I also try to encourage them to like it's, it's such a hard situation to me because it's like what do you say to somebody stay in Somalia but at the same time um, you know, like, you know Libya exists, what's happening in the Mediterranean, like, you know European governments don't want these people, you know that Australia is definitely not going to take them on, like, I, yeah, it's, it's tough. There's no pathway, because what no do you pathway. advise them? Yeah. If they yeah. come and land through Australia, they're going to go through CI and up to either Nauru, or, well, yeah, they'll just go up to Nauru. So there is no actual political framework, and so... This is actually very sad and a lot needs to be done um there are a lot of this a lot of atheistic organizations that, uh, that i mean the only one that i can think of that's actually credible is richard dawkins foundation uh center for inquiry um that's the only one and there are a lot of vultures in there as well as some of you whether well, i don't know whether you know or not but i mean there, there's one guy that i tried to help and we raised some funds in my own personal capacity and whatnot. And that was about a year and a half ago now. We flew him out of Pakistan. He's in Nepal right now. Um, he's been in Nepal for some time now. And I think his uh, Center for Inquiry helped him a lot to keep his expenses uh, running. Uh, I think they send him some amount of money which, is, uh, which supports him in Nepal. Um, and his asylum status was approved, and then he, he, he's a pretty nice, I mean, he's a pretty intelligent guy. Well, he's an ex-Muslim. Um, so he, he, he reached out to a lot of organizations. Center for Inquiry was the only one that uh, helped him out, and now he secured some donors, and now we're hoping that he would finally be able to get to Canada. Um, but his story was just one of so many and I, um, there's, on my YouTube channel, if you, if you look up Parasult and, and then you uh, look for Spartacus in there, you, you would listen to his whole story. And if that doesn't move you, I don't know what will. And, and somebody asked me that, you know, like some people get really emotional with the ex-Muslim thing and whatnot. Uh, some of us are very privileged that, you know, we didn't have any negative experience. But if you listen to his story, then you would realize that how bad the world is out there. I mean, this guy was beaten, tortured for simply asking one question that any reasonable person would ask uh, about Muhammad's marriage with the child bride, whether that's true or not. I don't know which camp you belong to. But that's besides the point. Um, his own mother... Um, he later found out that his own mother had planned that kidnapping. Although whether she wanted him to be tortured that brutally or not, that we don't know, but she definitely wanted him to be beaten up, to be taught a lesson. Um, and then he, um, so anyway, so he was on the run for eight years and whatnot. And then I, he reached out to me and I initially didn't want to 
get involved, as Noon rightly said, that is so that there's nothing out there. I mean, there's nothing we can do, really. I mean, there's so many messages I get. I mean, I can show you, my father, there's, there are literally hundreds of messages from people um, in, in countries like Pakistan, for instance, that just want to get out. Um, but there's no concerted effort, especially for atheists. I mean, for Christians, there's some level of support group. Mm -hmm. for, for, for other minorities, there's some level. Ahmadis are pretty organized. I mean, they get, they're extracting thousands of Ahmadis from Pakistan to Western countries. But for atheists, there's, there's literally next to nothing. As I said, Center for Inquiry is the only one. And that is also very limited in its resources. Um, so, yeah, there, there definitely needs to be something. Even though Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain... Uh, ex-Muslims of North America, they, they're doing pretty good work, but the scale is still very small, and there are shocking horror stories that, that would make you literally, that would make, you know, anyone cry, um, but unfortunately there's nothing we can do, and, and, and even, even with this one guy, it's like a lifelong process pretty much, like it's been a year and a half, and it might be another year by the time he gets out of Canada, and I'm constantly in touch with him and I'm you know, tr trying to do whatever I can. Um, but that's just one guy. And the process is so messy that I've made a commitment to myself that I'm not going to get involved in that again. Uh, might sound very selfish, but unfortunately, there's not much we can do. Yeah. I think another issue um, which has been coming up, I don't know if I need this, um, has been... I know a number of atheists, ex-Muslims who are currently in Australia. They came here as students. They came here on working visas. They are being dragged through the system, being like, "Well, I'm sorry, but you're, we don't. You're not proving to us that your life's in danger." But they are, and it's they're like I've had to write a letter of support for an individual who went through some of the most unimaginable things and they are a law-abiding citizen of this country the only thing is that they're just not an Australian citizen and you know they're trying to do that and we don't even have those resources here in Australia to be as mm. open and accepting and the other tricky thing I think as well about getting people from like Muslim countries is you need to have boots on the ground yeah. you need to have trust you need to have networks yeah, yeah, yeah. there was a um, Probably by the time this goes live, um, in the last 24 to 48 hours, a young ex Muslim Somali girl was dragged to Kenya by her family. She had no means of escaping, no way to get out. She reached out to a prominent ex Muslim Somali lady um, who has gone, I don't know what to do. How do I get this US citizen from Kenya? Her family have taken her phone off her. She has no access to internet. Like, how do I help this girl? And she was, I'm like to her, well, look, my only option is you've got to reach out to the Atheist Society of Kenya. And so she did that. And even then they were like, we don't know what to do. Um, and I was like, contact the U.S. Embassy. She contacts the U.S. Embassy, gives them all of this girl's details. And even then they were like, well, we can't really do anything. Thankfully, the she was being moved from the city to a small country town and the Atheist Society got wind of it and they essentially hijacked the car that her family were taking her in massive chase through Nairobi essentially for that girl ended up in a major car accident um gets to the u.s embassy and they're still like what do you want us to do and very this is a quickly, u.s wanna... citizen yes. but, but, sorry you, yeah, you got sorry to... just very very quickly just to put it into perspective so i worked in immigration detention for four years as a psychologist um these are people who are in immigration detention there are a lot of people who have family we have family here, family back home. They have a community that, if nothing else, gives them a sense of psychological support and, and comfort that there are people behind me or ahead of me who are rooting for me. And that gives them at least something to give them resilience within that awful system. And now you're talking about an ex-Muslim? This, this is a group of people who have nada. There's no tribe, there's no community, there's nothing. They don't even have that psychological resilience to give them that elasticity to survive the process of asylum seeking. So the hopeless answer for the present. And also think about, think about you are essentially on, like in, a, in an asylum or a detention center. You're with a bunch of other humans locked in cages. 
that mentality that will grow out and then you turn around and it gets heard out that you're not one of them they these people hide it they don't tell about they don't tell other people their also they don't trust anyone because the very real consequence of you being an ex-muslim in those sorts of environments is death immigration detention itself would be a threat to an ex-muslim we we have uh, if you if you've seen that uh, Egyptian TV of Mohammed yeah. Nofal, I think he uh, when I went to Germany I met him and he said that he was being put in a room next to a Muslim and you know he he was hiding his homosexuality and he was hiding his uh, ex Muslimness because he knew that he said you know like it, within the place where he's being stay where he's staying at he could be he could be killed. Um, Having said that, what uh, Ishmael just said, that no elasticity, that guy Spartacus, his, 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 uh, his, whole, his mother wanted him dead. Um, so he's got absolutely no family member, absolutely zero, who is waiting for him, is wondering where he went. He's been missing for the last eight years. Um, and, and, you know, that's it. He just, and, then, and then people dare to ask that why are you so angry at Islam or even Muslims for that matter? I mean, look what you've done to him. Yeah. Um, and we, we have one gentleman right here in this room who, who in this country, has been in this country for a while, and he has to somehow keep proving that he's an atheist and he, he would not survive if he went back to Pakistan. And our immigration department, I don't know, the, the murderers and rapists can, can slip through, mm -hmm. but law-abiding people... Genuine people just can't get to stay here. There, there, there's one guy in Sydney that, that I wrote a couple of reference letters for the last, I don't know, three or four years. He's been trying to convince the immigration department, no, whatever it's called, border, borders and... Border force. Yeah. Um, it, it, it trying to convince them that, hey, I am an atheist. His father got a circular issued in the newspaper, lo in the local newspaper that... You know, that he is an atheist, he's an apostate. When he comes back, he's a he's a blasphemer. Arrest him, kill him, or whatever. It's a, they, we showed the news clipping that his father took out as a classified ad to the Department of Immigration, and they're still trying to say, "Are you really an atheist?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just terrible. Um, I was just going to say one point on. Um, I think in the short term, it's just. Um, when it pertains to refugees, it sounds like um, the easiest idea is to bring every ex-Muslim mm. to the Western world. But I actually don't think that that's a solution. Um, I think in the long term, what the better solution is, is trying to get to support and facilitate change in the Islamic world. So, um, you know, we already know, I think they're getting Richard Dawkins' books translated. They've already got them in Urdu and Arabic yeah, and all that. They're so widely popular. You know, we need them translated in Somali. We need these resources. We need scientific books, philosoph philosophical books. These people, like, it's, it's not, we're all human beings. Uh, we're all capable of self-actualization, you know. I just think with the right tools. So um, I just feel like um, if we could get more um, education to them in the long mm. term, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, so our podcast is called Waq Nation. So Waq is the um, pre-Islamic god of the Somali people, or what, the Kushtic people, so some people in um, Ethiopia and Eritrea as well. So when we first started, um, so Somali atheists kind of use Waq as a symbol, because, um, you know, in Somali language, there's a lot of Arabic um, words, a lot of religious language, so there's a lot of God mentioning. So wherever we used to use Allah, we'll use Waq, you know, to as an affront to Somali Muslims. Um, so I remember about three years ago when we started this whole trend, um, Somali Muslims were vehemently against this so-called pre-Islamic God. So Waq is like our, like our Zeus, Greek Zeus, if you like, you know? So um, initially it was just like, what is this? This is not even part of our history. We've always been Muslim. We, we just never had a history before Islam. Like just don't even talk about it. Like forget about, because they were polytheists and you know, every, in Islam, polytheists are like the worst of the worst. Um, so anyway, now, two years later, um, I'm actually happy to report, I now get messages from Somali Muslims like, change your name from Wa Nation because we don't want our history, our history, our history associated with your atheist podcast. Now, they think I'm supposed to be offended by that, but I see that as a big win because now they're taking ownership of a, a history that 
is outside of Islam. Mm. And if that's possible, like from me seeing that, I feel like if we get more information and knowledge to people, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to shift mm. millions of minds, you know, to at least, they might not be not Muslims, but maybe we can make them not be head, not be <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If we can get that elementary thing, I think it's a win. Thanks so much for your answers. Uh, any more questions? Yes? So you guys all ex-Muslim. Is there any teaching or habit that you still use or, you know, <laughs> habit like me? <laughs> I still don't eat pork, I still don't drink. I, still um, I think for me, one of the biggest things was, mashallah, subhanallah, Inshallah, so Alhamdulillah. So oh, essentially, yeah. it's it's ingrained in you. You religious say something, speech. yeah, it's religious speech. So um, you say someone is beautiful, you say, oh, Masha'Allah, yeah. because you don't want God to put the evil eye on them. Or, oh, I'm going to go and do something, Inshallah, if God will. So I think for me, it took me a bit of time to step away from from that. Yeah, definitely. That's because so it right. becomes like, you know, I think it's when we all... You know, we've all got them in English, um, just sayings that we just off the top of our head, like, oh, God forbid, even though we're all atheists, I'm pretty sure we've all said it at some point. Mm -hmm. So I feel like for me personally, that's probably one thing that I had when I first left. But that, I mean, I left like for a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, I feel like I drink now way less than I did when I was a Muslim. I still drink. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I used to drink more. Mine is. I have very few filters when I'm not wearing my psychologist cap, so you'll all forgive me. Mine is going to the toilet and washing with water because ew, yes, course, yeah. to dry cleaning. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, yes. But then but I don't see that as Islamic. I see that as Yeah, that's cultural. It's not really a Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's not? Muslims don't all know? Oh, I thought it was a Muslim thing. Because no. it's not like the Muslim shower. The yeah. Right, <laughs> right. It's not the Muslim shower. The hand is Muslims it's them, them. Oh, sorry, it's not. So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it may not be a part of Islam. I was taught in Pakistan that it is a part of Islam that Muslims are especially clean. And so, after using the toilet, we wash with water. We don't just dry clean. And that's why we are so clean. Asian, Asian culture. Asian culture. <laughs> and so we have a little. Uh, it's hose that that is attached next to the toilet that you wash with and it's called a, a muslim shower, shower uh, <laughs> to wash with and so that is a staple part whether that's cultural or religious i'm just learning it's cultural i was, I was told it's because islam is the best religion I was, actually, I was actually shocked uh, when because I, I grew up as well thinking that a muslim shower is only unique to Muslims, Muslims to wash their backsides and when I went to all these other countries and I saw the same similar showers and there were you know like Thailand and you know India used it, Hindus use it too I was like oh okay so we're not that special after all um, I okay well I, I wouldn't go there well I, 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 I just no, no I think it's just funny that I, I found a work I found a work around because I was thinking is there anything that I do I mean I've tried bacon pork I mean I, I'm trying to eat less animals so so that's why that's the reason why I don't eat bacon, or, but I don't eat cows or uh, beef or goat either. But 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 I found a work work around it, and I do feel uncomfortable when I've done you know number two. <laughs> so so I don't wash it. I actually go ahead and go and have a shower. So that's where all the water is going, basically. <laughs> <laughs> For me, yeah. For me, though, okay. My. The main thing I still appreciate about Islam, sorry, is the Ramadan, the month. Mm -hmm. So it adds one more meal to my day. So I go <laughs> breakfast, lunch, iftar, and dinner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do too. I love yeah, yeah, sorry, The biryani is so good, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 don't know. I don't care. Yeah. But yeah. you yeah. 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 A lot of my ex Muslim friends really have trouble letting go of the aversion to pork. I did not find it that difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I think, um, yeah, the one of the first time, like, I think it was like maybe a week after I like came out to myself as ex Muslim, I like tried pork and I loved it. <laughs> I was like, from that. Um, alcohol, that was uh, much, um, much more ingrained the, because, um, you know, alcohol is like 
drink. So what? yeah, no, no, no. Now, <laughs> but like, <laughs> well, I feel like. Because you know what we used to but say. I never drank when I was Muslim. Okay, I wasn't good Muslim. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to hell. I, <laughs> you know we have a saying. They used to say, you know, alcohol, uh, pork doesn't get you high, or doesn't get you drunk and intoxicated. That's the excuse they say. You know, so they say, what's the, what's the, yeah. why can't you just eat lamb or pork? Or, you know, beef or is alcohol yeah. doesn't something to do. <laughs> <laughs> there do there is mean? actually a hadith on that. There, there, there's a, a narrative. Uh, sorry, the narration on that where. Um, some Muslims, it shows how even early Muslims were trying to bend and reinterpret Islam, <laughs> that one of the caliphs, the second caliph, Omar, he was once caught having alcohol. This is after the death of Muhammad. He had, he had a little flask or thermos or whatever, and it had alcohol in it. The companion who was traveling with him, he thought, oh, okay, I'll just have a sip. You know, like he couldn't help himself. And he had it. Omar beat the hell out of him. And he said, but Omar, you, you've got alcohol too. Why, why, why are you beating me? He goes, no, I only sip, but you're getting drunk on it. <laughs> so it's actually getting drunk that's forbidden, not actually having alcohol. But now Muslims these days, they don't even use perfume for some reason because it's got some alcohol. Oh, in yeah, yeah. So, so, so people have always been, and, and I've met a lot of Muslims now who, who, who still have, uh, you know, who have alcohol, but Pork is worse, apparently. Oh, you bring up the perfume thing. I remember this funny story about my mom. Um, my mom used to make these, like, um, these, like, really delicious cakes and would use, you know, like, those queens, um... Vanilla? Like, vanilla, essence. vanilla essence. Yeah. And so, <laughs> one day she discovered, like, I don't know like, why well, she never remembered the ingredients, but she found out from some online blog that it has, like, point something like percent of alcohol in it. And she had a total nervous breakdown. And it was like, I've been feeding alcohol to my children for years. And it was like, and spent, like, two nights, like, praying and begging for attention. <laughs> because she'd oh intoxicating us for, like, over a decade. Somebody <laughs> needs to break it to the Brunswick Muslims that kombucha. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they talk about extra chew chewing gum, extra chewing gum they don't eat. Extra chewing gum, like you're talking about, like long I think yeah. just yeah. off the back of that, I would like to state that everyone's journey out of like Islam is very different. Like I don't drink, um, you know, I don't do, dr I've never touched drugs or that. And it's nothing to do with me being raised as a Muslim and having a hang up. It's just my personal choice. So if you are someone who is leaving a religion, you don't necessarily have to start drinking and mm -hmm. start having. It's like yeah. there's yeah. no time on when you have to have those experiences. There's no time have when a bit you of have fun. to stop. <laughs> have a bit of fun. You know, as a Muslim, not do drugs because you're not yeah. living. Don't you think it's sort of like. Because of that grow up, that what makes me don't do drugs, so then I don't have to fight for it. Like I mean, Aziz and I had a very similar upbringing. He's free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a control freak. No, I think what I'm trying to say right now is that there's no time on when you have to stop. Um, you know, like I know people who have Muslim women, like ex-Muslim women, sorry, who've left Islam, but they've never taken their hijabs off, so they still wear the hijab. Which is, there are yeah. small things that they've because yeah. it's just what they're used to. And I think sometimes when you leave Islam, it's a step-by-step -step process. You don't have to jump in guns are blazing and try every drug under the sun, every alcohol in the sun, every single thing that was haram to you bad. within the first two months of you leaving. It's, and don't think less of yourself if you don't do any of those things either. There is nothing wrong with it. There are plenty of people out there who've never had a drink or never done drugs and never had pork or, or never done any of that. Yeah, but let's not put alcohol and drugs in the same category. Kids, stay out of drugs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, let's move on to our... Sorry, next question. Uh, next question? Uh, yes. Um, I'm going to ask you know, about having conversations about this outside of a room, like put a bit more assembly in. There's a problem you have often when you, you're basically enjoying the what about them very, very quickly. And what's a good way to get past that without sounding horrible? <laughs> you know, so that, that, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, don't know I sound like a dick most times, so people just expect it from me. Um, but it's like we could sit here and go around circles. Okay, cool. Uh, you're talking about ex-Muslims. Well, what about Muslims being prosecuted in here? Oh, the latest one that really frustrated me. I'm not sure if anyone was aware, but obviously there was the anniversary of the Holocaust that came past recently. I was getting so angry at the comments that I was seeing from like Muslims. Oh, but what about the Muslims currently in prison? Oh my. It's not the same tragedy. It's, it's a same. separate tragedy in a different time. So I could turn around and, you know, be, what about this, what about that? But that's not going to solve anything. 
at the end of the day, this is the discussion you're wanting to have, this is the conversation you want to be had. Cool, you know what? I will say, yeah, I, I do not agree with what the Chinese are doing to the, you know, the, the Uyghur Muslims, but that doesn't deflect from the fact that this is also a crap thing to be doing. And that's exactly it, just gently pointing out, naming one thing doesn't take away or detract from the other. So you can name one a human rights atrocity, which doesn't detract from another. So when people come up with the whataboutism, the only way to do it is to acknowledge, name, say, yep, yeah, yes, that happened. But this also simultaneously, human beings have the wonderful capacity to do a lot of bad things all at the same time. There was a video that went viral, but like, I think, yeah, you said the same thing. Next question. We'll uh, yes, next question. Uh, uh, two things. Um, one, when people abandon a religious belief, they also abandon all the social control prohibitions. And the temptation is to be as naughty as possible and say, well, all these things you try to stop me from doing, that's what I want to do. It's not growing up. And growing up and developing your own philosophy of life is a lifetime thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll end up with different ones. I'm just wondering what sort of struggles you've all been experiencing in developing your own independence, rational view of how to live well. For me, I think I did more drugs, more alcohol, and more high-risk behavior when I was a Muslim. And leaving Islam and the slow, reflective process, because it wasn't an impulse. You don't impulsively leave a tribe, a community, and a belief system. It's a slow, meditative, mindful, conscious process. And that in itself gives you so much insight into who you are as a person and what your values are. And so I think just that journey informs me. Um, also, yeah, also, the other thing I was going to ask is, um, I've come across a lot of people who feel that when they abandon their theological belief, they stop believing in a God, it's still expected that they would accept that the social ethic that they got brought up with is a good social ethic. So you can be a godless, Christian, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, or a godless Muslim, and still accept all the social ethics is good. But social ethics have nothing to do with religion. I feel I have rejected nearly all of the Jewish ethic that I came from as a child, because I think it's thoroughly evil. And I'm just wondering whether you've come to that sort of position, that the, the ethic that you grew up with, you've now become very, very critical of, or you say, well, I don't believe in a God, but the ethic I grew up with is still a good one. And I'm not a You've got to understand that when someone does leave uh, his or her religion, that the, the, they're basing it on something, and that's reason. So when you when you reason, when you start looking into things critically, one by one, you can you can recognize, okay, well that doesn't make sense, and that does make sense. So the part that actually does end up making sense, which is also common with your ex-religious belief. That doesn't mean that you're actually doing it because just for the hell of it or, or just because you were raised as that. It's just probably in that person's view. And I find people, apostates from any religion, to be one of the most reasonable people. I mean, they, there's something that drives them to leave a religion. It's not easy. It's very difficult to, to throw away everything purely based on reasoning power. Uh, and so... I mean, one could say, okay, well, what's, what's so harm, what, what, what's so wrong in marrying when a girl is 15 or 16, for that matter? I mean, biologically speaking, someone, one would, might argue that, okay, Jordan Peterson would be the first one to tell you that, okay, no, it's okay to, to marry young. I don't think you would say 15, 16, but maybe 18 would be ideal because that way, you know, we would have more children, healthy children, whatnot. And, and that would be something that would come out directly from religious ethics or norms but as we get more and more um, uh, independent and we become more and more proud of ourselves, we want to build our careers and whatnot, that might pay a price. But that's fine. But again, the person who's making a decision is not choosing social ethics or social traditions based on they were raised with that. They, I, I'm, I'm sure the others would probably think the same as well, but we're all in different individuals. But if it makes sense, if you can reasonably justify it, I would adopt it. I don't care where it comes from. But if it doesn't, then screw it. It's not a reactive process. It's a responsive process. It's not an impulsive, oh, well, this is awful, so I'm going to swing to that direction. It's a conscious, mindful, responsive process where you can actually consciously, without the dictates of a belief system, pick and choose 
with awareness and as a higher reason. said reason. I think it's a tr what's a tricky thing to understand is Muslims are not just Arab. Muslims are from, look at this panel right now, we're from all different backgrounds. I grew up in a blended mixed household, so my mum is a convert, my stepdad is Somalian, so I grew up in an East African household and I am sure that, you know, um, Noon and Aziz are going to agree with me, there are some aspects of East African culture which is absolutely amazing and beautiful that we were raised in. Right. You know, like, you know, if someone's sick, the whole community's there. They'll look after your kids. They'll do everything for yeah. you. Like they are there for you. you know, in other words, yeah. So those aspects I love. The parts of Islam which are like you know about giving charity to people. Like that is such an important thing. Like we should always be giving back to our community, whether it's monetary Loving or in our orphans. actions. You know, <laughs> Loving the orphans. That that's another. Yeah, thing. I mean, so, there's some exactly. just because but it has nothing to do with religion. Yes. Have good things to do. Exactly. No, but yeah, religions exactly. have owned it. The, the, yeah. Religion yeah. Religion yeah. Yeah. Claim. it came from us, but those are just good things to do. Exactly. Yes, which religion that. kind of appropriated? Which I like. I like to kind of say this that when I get told, oh, you're making, my own mother has said this to me, she's like, oh, you're making Islam look bad. I'm like, Islam is bad, but Muslims can be individually good people. They can be better than Islam. They, yeah, Muslims they can are be better, better than, than and, and then they can be better than their religion. I have met some of the sweetest, most amazing, giving, caring, considerate people that I would call my closest friends who are Muslim. The only issue between the two of us is God. Really? And a flying donkey. <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to say just before, like, about some of the challenges for me, I think, as, um, you know, I feel like I was indoctrinated from a young age mm -hmm. um, in shame and honour culture, so I still struggle now as an ex muslim I've been an ex muslim for like five years or whatever, but I still struggle with my own sexual liberation, I feel mm -hmm. like. It's just so much baggage. And even in the West, because it's st we still have patriarchy and misogyny, like, a mi much milder misogyny that... I, th I still feel like women are not allowed in any world to be sexual beings in the same way men are. Um, so coming from an Islamic background, it's just like there's just so much layers to what I, it. It's about unlearning for me, you know, mm -hmm. and it's yeah challenging to say the least. Uh, our next question. Oh, yes. Hi, it's not very difficult. Yeah, there just seems to be a lack of analysis of what this land is. And everything I've heard today, there hasn't been that much analysis of what this land is. Is it really a religion? I, I can understand Sufism. I've looked at Sufism, and yeah, that's a real religion. But is Islam a religion? It's a way I don't of life. Know, is there any, Sufism, Sufism comes from Islam. So the Sufism comes from Islam. They say to solve is the, the science of Islam. So yeah, one, yeah, but they, uh, what's, your the question? What's, your question? what's your question? What's your question? Is it, is it really yeah, a religion? Yes. Spiritual in. Yeah. Is that what the defines religion. a religion to your mind? Spirituality is that the defining factor of a religion? Well, religion is spirituality. That's what it's all about. Are you religious? Yes. Okay. That's your personal. What? What? Just, what is? I mean, you know, like I mean, we're, yeah. sorry. We don't, in all seriousness, yeah. I mean, I, I I hear from people all the time this word spirituality, and I think it's much more confused and probably a worse word, worse word than religion itself. What is spirituality? What is it? Is it is it is it like the raising of your hair when you? Uh, listen to a really amazing speech like or something. What 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 is it? You asking me a question? Yeah, I'm asking you a question. What is spirituality? Oh, that's simple. It's been well defined, particularly in the Hindu culture. Yeah, but what's your spirituality? Well, spirituality is not a positive term. It comes across as a negative term, and it's about the contrast between what is material. And what seems to be less material. Now, if you understand, this is why they say it's a negative term. In other words, spirituality concerns things which are above. So, uh, we're going in boo-boo now. I think we're going in boo-boo now. Yeah. I think we're going in boo boo now, which is which, which is your. Which, which, uh, and also fundamentally, religion. Religion is a control system. That's how it evolved. It evolved out of economic and control systems of inheritance, uh, property management, how to manage all of those things, including um, 
setting up tribal rules and systems in place and monitor people's behavior. That's how religion, spirituality has nothing to, to do, do with, religion. with religion. But oh, spirituality. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. But, no, 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 I'm not but done. Spirituality is nothing. Done. With anything either. Spirituality is nothing. Spirituality is nothing. Okay, good one. That's it. Beautiful. All right, John. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, how does spirituality? Yeah. Okay, next question, please. People, people have been people have been performing human sacrifices for five thousand years. Doesn't mean that we have to respect it. Yeah. Right. That was a good point. That was a one liner. That was a really good point. That was a one liner, man. You killed it. <laughs> Okay, so, so relating to before and after you left this up, what was your relationship with the Prophet Muhammad and how did like, your, your opinion of the Muslims? Oh. How did that change? Oh. Because I know that when I was in this time, I really, really tried to revere him above everything. And you know, uh, one of the things that really made me doubt Islam is because I was part of these Sufi groups, and one of them, one of the speakers really said something like that kind of blew my mind. He said, God would not have created an entire universe if not for. And that kind of made me think, wait, the entire universe is telling us about God? And even when I was Muslim, I kind of had this. No, he's asked, okay, so one liner on that. I mean, I think Ivan here posted a meme a few days ago. What was my relationship with the great Prophet Muhammad was that when you put, a, when you put in Google, Who's the greatest man on earth? And Prophet Muhammad comes up. And that was my life. That was my mind. That was everything. So that was my relationship with Muhammad. I think it's what I said greatest man. when I spoke earlier, is that Muslims are taught that they should emulate Muhammad and his companions of the time. And for myself personally, I was just like, oh, it's the dude that I have to like. He's the one that God gave his message to and he delivered it. Um, so you can't even emulate him. You're a woman. Well, you, you love him though. But you I love, love him though. Like you kind of like a um, relationship in your head. With him. But Can so you marry like, eleven? But his characteristics. So you know, like that's what we were taught to emulate and be like. And so, but I, I guess I was a little bit different. I never saw him as like a saint. I never saw him as some Christians may see Jesus. Um, I was just like he was the the middleman no, that God gave him a message and he passed it on. And all Muslims should try to be like him. And after leaving us, I'm not a second thought was given to him. I feel like. I used to get physical anxiety. You know, the, you know, there's a, that tradition of like giving shifa to the prophet, like saying salam mm -hmm. and saying yes, every yeah. once a day, I, like because so he won't forget you in Akana. Like so, so there's this tradition in Islam that says that you've got to remember the prophet every day. You know, as many times as you can, so he remembers you when you need him the most, and you're about to be at household. So I was really convinced. Like I, I would get physical anxiety if I did not say it like a few times a day, like because you're. Quite, you love him so much. And not only that, you feel like he's some kind of saviour, which is kind of weird now looking back at hindsight, because how could he be the Messiah if we were waiting for a mum Messiah? <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah. uh, John? Yeah, um, just on this question about Muhammad and uh, the historical figures, I mean, how important do you think it is to, to look at the actual history that these religions and uh, what Actually, Islam is a, is a follow on religion from Judaism and Christianity, and all the, the antecedents rely on the uh, authenticity of the Jewish prophets. So, how, how important it is to, do you think that you question the, when you're trying to talk to um, Muslims and maybe Put that in mind. How, how important is it to look? Is that, is that coming from the works of Dan Gibson and Tom Holland and those kind of people? Like about, proving Muhammad's existence? Yeah. It's not. It's, I, think, I think they... I, 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 I think... I think even the scholarly work of these people itself, I mean, they've admitted that there's, you know, like that. To me, it sounds conspiracy conspiratorial mm -hmm. and and I, I don't think that it would even Tom Holland said that that uh, it, 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 even though certain pieces of puzzles don't fit but it just sounds too grand for it to be a conspiracy yes. to have been concocted after 
Muhammad died and some people just invented this character and first coin appears 40 years or 60 years after his death and whatnot and there was no mention of him before that in independent history and all that. But how I mean, is there is some evidence to say that the, the Quran itself... No, 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 we're talking outside of the, the traditional Islamic, yeah, we're, we're talking about the history, independent history. But, but in general, general, I think it's very conspiratorial. Important. There there are far better ways of dealing with yes. Islam. My question than, would be yeah. what would you hope to achieve okay. by yes. using yes. that yes. line yes. of discussion? It might appeal to some people. Possibly, but, but essentially if you're speaking to somebody who's Muslim, that line of uh, it's not to, work, get, no. to get traction, to get a conversation going, I don't know what your goal would be. I, I think you're thinking like a Westerner here. You you're, you're being too reasonable here, that you're looking you're trying to look into hard evidence. But when your mind is just well, like shut down, up, like a left, like non-religious. Well, no, yeah. well, yeah, but like most. No, but, okay, but most Westerners do tend to act like that. But. Yeah. Uh, next question. Getting back to this spiritual versus religious thing, just a comment which might fall some fire from some of you. Religion, as I see it, is very much about being being part of a tribal culture where you've got communal rituals, where you have a communal religious hierarchy which dictates conformity to the rules. It's very much about the age of conformity. Spirituality is about there is no tribe, there are no rituals, there is no religious hierarchy. What goes on in my head, totally unrelated to what's going on in your head, is my spirituality. So is atheism. The age of individualism. But so is atheism. Yes, sir, but so is atheism. I and mean, we can say the same thing. I mean, we're, we're not a part of any tribe. It's just whatever goes, I stand by, I stand for something, she stands for something else. Right. And that's yeah, fine, but whatever goes. Spiritual, but, but, but again, that's the problem. Sure. So throw out the word spirituality. Because uh, I can't define it. Tribe, that's all right. Okay, if you don't have a direct question, I'll wrap with the Okay. Um, I've heard an expression that uh, ex-Muslims share one huge, massive, important thing in common and nothing else. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Being you find it difficult to share the ex-Muslim experience but then have a potential clash along sort of grievances or cultural issues. You know, like uh, sectarian lines, and class and race and other things I, like that. I don't you want to work with someone and then expose stuff, but then there's so much other stuff around it. I have an answer to that. Very much so. Uh, when I'm talking about ex Muslim and being an ex Muslim, and then when I'm approached by others who are not ex Muslim, who are not Muslim, who are don't share the lived experience of having belonged to that culture, that group, that religion, but espouse the ideas they think I espouse and then they want to take my ideas forward for me, I struggle with that because for me that seems inauthentic. So for me, it would be like a man saying, ah, oh, because I am a dad, because I have a wife and I had a mom, I can speak for women, because I've, I've been a witness, and I'm like, nah, nah, no you can't. As a person, or people who come to me, who's like, oh, I've been to India or Pakistan, I, I, I know your cult, no you don't. I lived there for 20, you could live there for your entire life. Your skin is white, you cannot speak for me. And that applies also to the lived experience of being an ex-Muslim, and the complexities it involves, it's very, very complex. So trying to understand and look at how you can be a voice for that is a something that requires sensitivity, nuance, and sophisticated thought. I think as well, when you do have ex-Muslims of like a Shiite background or a Sunni background, most of us just tend to say, kind of outdo each other of how stupid the religion was. <laughs> I mean, I have many ex-Shiite friends and I'm always like, yeah, like I was Sunni, but I, I never, um, you know, locked myself in a dark room and beat myself to because, you know, it's Muhammad's or someone's birthday, which Ali. is the custom of the, uh, Ali's birthday, Ali's sorry. Birthday. You know, I, I never saw my dad's take knives at himself. Was that Yeah. Like, yeah like, mom was saying, like, when uh, we have ex-Muslims from different backgrounds of, like, Shia and Sunni lines, uh, I think we, we more or less kind of bond over the silliness of the faith that we were raised in. It's a bit of a trickier thing to navigate as someone, you know, when I'm speaking. I, a very good example is I used to work in an area very... It was a customer-facing um, sort of role, um, and a lot of my clientele were Muslims, 
and one person's like, oh, so you're, you're, you're an ex-Muslim, you left Islam. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had a great conversation back and forth. And they've gone, I know why you left Islam. You're Sunni. If you just knew <laughs> that Shia in Islam, you wouldn't have left. So I guess it's all kind of about having yeah. those conversations and identities. But like we all have, we've said previously, just because you're an ex-Muslim, you can still be a right wing, you can be left, you can still have all these hang-ups. It's for political me, now. Mm. Like, for example, I, I'm not, like, I'm, like, I'm not an ideologue, but, you know, I've run into, had a few run-ins with some ex-Muslim communists. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not really intense. Yeah. Um, so things like that. Um, definitely in the Somali space, what I found is still, even after, you know, um, We've abandoned Islam. We have an issue with tribalism, so mm -hmm. we're trying to combat that. But you know, we've tried to make so many groups and stuff like that. People have political grievances, like so. It's like aside from religion, people are like, "Well, your grandfather stole my grandfather's goat. I'm still not moving on from that." You know, so like it's, it and is that the, petty. Like the Somalilanders, the Somalia, it's so exhausting. Yeah. Really. It's so exhausting. Um, but yeah, so we still have that kind of challenge. I personally, like I said, I'm an individual. You know, mm -hmm. I see myself, but yeah, it's. I think as well, I think it, just that just reminds me is I grew, obviously grew up in the Somali world. Right. Um, clearly not Somalian though. Right. Uh, yeah, is, so. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like something I have noticed, um, I think you can, you, maybe everyone here can have a degree on, probably not the guys, um, but the women that do, like, even from ex Muslim men, you feel like you're being policed as a woman? Oh my god, definitely. I, I definitely get a lot from Somali ex Muslim men, for example. You know, the, I think somebody said it earlier, like, there's so many different reasons why we leave, and so a lot of um, what I found a lot of Somali atheist men are still misogynists, mm -hmm. still homophobes. Like, and I'm just like, okay, so I guess we're not in the same group. <laughs> like, geez. but so yeah, so that's one thing I'm very wary of. Um, that misogyny, particularly, um, a lot of ex-Muslim men haven't really abandoned mm -hmm. that. Actually, most of them do not leave for human rights issues. You yes. know what I'm saying? They're leaving for theological, really for theological yeah. and intellectual and, reasons. Yeah, yeah. And they seem to be quite proud of that. Like, yeah. oh, you know, nobody hurt me. You know, you guys are just abused. And it's like, oh, well, gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I'm very mindful of excellence on men, straight, which is like, you know, I've, I've, I've used that line. <laughs> sorry, I didn't get abused. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, dinner will be, uh, be getting soon. If you only bought a dating gift, it would like to stay back for dinner. Please just inform Alex.